I'm going to introduce him. His, his name is Bill Bimel. Uh, he's a managing director of Spurs Capital and First Lean Capital. Uh, Bill has an excellent track record uh, in MPLs and, and residential loans. Um, today's presentation is a ticking. Bill, um, yes, sir. Will, you, will you project your screen for me? I, I will, as soon as you release, yep. Here we go. And you can hear me all okay? We can hear you perfect. Wonderful. There you go. Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending. My name is Bill Bimel. Uh, I am a managing director at Spurs Capital. I appreciate you spending the next half hour with me today as I update you on the status of the mortgage lending industry and the secondary mortgage market. Um, we will primarily be focusing on residential mortgage loans today as that's what my company specializes in. However, much of what I discussed today will also pertain to the commercial credit and capital markets as well. Uh, it's my intention to get through this presentation in approximately 15 to 20 minutes so that I can leave time for questions and answers at the end. I encourage each of you to submit a question in the Q&A chat at the bottom of this screen. Do not hesitate to ask questions now or at any time. The sooner you get your questions in earlier, the greater the chance they will be answered live today. If I run out of time at the end of this presentation, I promise to answer each question individually in writing in the Q&A chat. Let's get started. Uh, the topic of my talk today is ticking debt bomb. Uh, I, as you can see, I chose a very anti-inflammatory topic because we live in such a non-polarized world and why get anxiety levels any higher? Of course, that's sarcasm. Uh, I'm gonna start with a little background about myself and my company, and then we're gonna talk about what we've seen in the mortgage industry in the last 90 days since COVID has come across, what we're seeing today in terms of opportunities in residential NPLs, and where we see this market going in the coming six to 12 months. I have just under two decades of experience in the real estate and mortgage business. I am a native of South Florida, graduate of NYU, uh, currently just moved to sunny Southern California, now living in Los Angeles. I started my career in real estate as a fix and flip residential investor, uh, then got into mortgage loan origination in the middle 2000s, like everyone, uh, when it seemed more common that people were mortgage loan originators than had driver's licenses. I'm also a partner in a retail tenant rep commercial advisory firm. So we do some dabble on the commercial side, primarily in multifamily retail or mixed use projects. In 2008, I got a call from a asset manager in Southern California who was looking for valuation and collateral uh, due diligence and advisory on a pool of non-performing residential mortgages in Florida. This was a light bulb moment for me. We started a division called RSI Asset Management specifically to cater to private equity investors in the NPL space. And I bought my own first NPL loan in 2009. What was important about this business for me was the paradigm by which we operated. Nobody wants to be a debt collector. Nobody likes that vulture aspect of the business. So when my partners and I got together and got into this business, we really wanted to create a new paradigm for loss mitigation and NPL management. A lot of what we, uh, how we operate is described in a book I published in 2017 called Win-Win Revolution. Spurs Capital is an investment management firm that was founded in 2009 by our CEO, Peter Slagowitz. Uh, our headquarters are in New York City. We have offices in Colorado, Florida, and California. We've placed just under one billion with a B of equity since our first fund launched in 2010. We've done this through five fund vehicles, each with a single institutional investment partner. We are in equity investors in the mortgage space. We do not leverage our, 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 our investments. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about leverage and, the, and, the, and what that can create. Our current AOM over three funds currently open is just over 100 million through our three active funds. Um, we have specialized in our loss mitigation, that paradigm I discussed. 
Uh, so we have gotten so good at what we do, we actually have become a third party enhanced loss mitigation advisor for some of the largest in mortgage investors in this industry. Names that all of you would recognize who have asked us to come in and help them with their portfolios in harder to work areas like New York or Florida, where you have judicial foreclosure, long foreclosure timelines, and you need an active manager like us to help. We have boots on the ground in all 50 states. What we're really key, keen in on is the surveillance of our servicers, uh, our relationships with the secondary market, people that we buy these loans from. And then we take that Wall Street strategy and bring it to Main Street. So as a liquidity provider to larger funds, we then turn around and try to act a little bit like a lifeboat to individual borrowers. And we'll get into some of the details, but that's primarily what we do. So where are we today? Uh, we're 12 years out from the last financial crisis. Uh, I remember uh, like it was yesterday, all of us speaking about how we need to deleverage, how we need to eliminate world debt, and we need to, to not be highly leveraged. This is what caused this financial crisis. Well, it seems like, according to this article from April of 2019 in Bloomberg, that the only ones that really got the message was the financial sector. Over the last uh, 11 years, you've seen very little increase in total debt in the financial sector, while non-financial corporates, household debt, and government debt, of course, have, have skyrocketed out of control. What's key to the, this market uh, is how vast it is. This is a $10 trillion residential mortgage market in America, just in America alone. Uh, and at any, any given day, uh, a typical default rate, like we saw pre-COVID, uh, we were seeing at the end of 2019 and early 2020, uh, was about 2 to 4%. So given that, that at any given time, you've got over $300 billion worth of mortgage debts, either in default or some stage of foreclosure. So we are, as $100 million players, we are a, a small fry in a large market. We only have to access a small share of this market in order to, 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 to uh, profit and, and put our money to work. Let's talk about the secondary mortgage market. Many of you know what it is and some may not. So, you know, I wanna drill it down to as simple as possible. And let's think of it like um, a pipeline of money. Uh, just like we all are used to going to the gas station to fill up our, our tanks with gas for our cars. And the only thing we really notice is a change in pricing of, you know, the uh, equivalent of a change in interest rates, we as consumers. But obviously, if the flow of that gas uh, is stalled or diverted in some way, we will notice it. And, and the secondary mortgage market is very much like the pipeline that delivers all this liquidity, all this cash to us as consumers and investors to buy real estate or whatever. Um, well, as we all remember, COVID set in in uh, late February, early March, we started to shut down the markets and there was quite a quiver. Um, but I do want to call your attention to, oops, I do want to call your attention to this November Reuters article from 2019, which indicated that dollar funding and liquidity might be risks even before the COVID situation came across. So we were already at the the, in a very, uh, the top end of the market and liquidity concerns were already starting to seep in. COVID obviously threw fuel on that fire. Um, and what happened in March as, ma as markets uh, started to crater equity markets, you started to see a real freeze in the liquidity markets and the credit markets um, that were backing mortgage investors, mortgage loan originators, and, um, and, and, and secondary mortgage traders. Um, and so what happened? Uh, for a few weeks, it looked pretty dismal, but the Federal Reserve and Congress came in and started printing a ton of money and acted as the buyer of last resort for a lot of the secondary mortgage market securities and mortgage loan portfolios and assets uh, that required buyers. Uh, so in doing so, 
the Fed offered a lifeline to the secondary mortgage market. But we did not get out unscathed. Uh, during those two weeks in March, uh, dozens, if not hundreds of investors and or lenders and originators in the mortgage market, especially in the non-QM residential mortgage market. And non-QM can also be referred to, in some cases, you've got the, the fix and flip investor loans that fall into that category, and you also have non-QM owner-occupied. Um, but we saw a number of loan originators in March overnight cease operations, revise their requirements for new, uh, uh, new loans. And why that happened was because the secondary money behind these guys came calling. And when times are good, uh, you know, a credit facility or a securitization or a bank that is lending money to a new originator doesn't mind leaving non-performing debt on their, on their balance sheet when there's plenty of cash to go around. Uh, but all of these credit facility agreements come with the caveat that at any moment, these, these, these credit facilities could come in and ask you these uh, borrowers, and when I say borrowers, I'm talking about the originators, not the end borrowers, ask them to mark to market their portfolios. And that's really what happened. So we saw a number of originators disappear overnight. Some of those might have been those spread players, like uh, the gentleman um, uh, was speaking about earlier today. Uh, and some of them were high leverage offering hard money loans. There was a lot of fraud in that industry. And what happened was many of these originators who had bad loans sitting on their credit line were all of a, for, all of a sudden forced to sell. That's where we came in. Um, we act as the liquidity provider to these type of people. We have been introduced to sellers in this market that we do not did not even know existed three months ago. Whether you're talking about hard money loan originators, you're talking about large $180 million tranches of C of commercial debt, private debt that uh, that is that should be trading at par or 102, but because of the strain in the market and because of the forced sale, we're now selling at 80 or 80, 85, 90% of value performing loans. Um, and because of that, we've seen opportunities over the last 90 days um, that increase exponentially. And so again, going back to our NPL uh, purchase strategy, we act as this liquidity provider to whole loan investors. I guess liquidity provider is the nice way to say we're vulture buyers from uh, holders of, of paper. Uh, and then we, and we turn that, that into a Robin Hood approach with our individual borrowers. See, those credit facilities that finance all of this mortgage debt um, are, or banks, uh, the value of a loan is based upon its performance. So uh, the, a bank looks to mark to market a non-performing loan and there really is no, no value. Now, if you're an originator sitting with $10 million of NPL on your line, you have two choices. You can buy that loan, the, that 10 million back from your credit facility and, and take those loans off the line, or you can go to guys like us on the secondary mortgage market who do understand that there's actual value in the underlying collateral. And, um, and in doing so, <clears throat> we, we've obviously seen a lot of uh, opportunity. Um, so what do we do? We have a very complex modeling system that has been refined over and over for years. It takes into account what direction values are going. It takes into to, uh, uh, consideration specific states, the timelines of foreclosure within certain counties. We get we drill down into uh, different types of residential loans with single family condos. We get very detailed in our modeling, and we take the underlying collateral value, subtract out through our modeling and our exit strategy expectations. Uh, a, a plus adding in an expected return. And that's how we come to uh, the price that we will pay. 
Uh, traditionally, we've been paying in an average of the 60s over the last five years, 60s of VPO value, meaning the value of the underlying collateral. Uh, if that loan has equity in it, we might be paying a higher percentage of UPV, but if the loan's upside down, we could be paying 30 or 40 percent of the unpaid principal balance. Um, and then we use that boots on the ground strategy to speed up resolution and create the arbitrage for our investors. Um, <clears throat> now, this is a very detailed process. I'm not going to go through all of what we do, but obviously we have teams all across the country with over a decade of experience working together in doing this. The key obviously on the front end is asset sourcing uh, and not just the ability to bid on assets. And we, we focus on a very specific trade size, five to $15 million worth of loans. We could buy one loan, we could buy 20, we could buy 50 at a time, but we play in a market under 50 million. We don't get involved in large trades. We don't want to compete with the big 800 pound gorillas who have a billion dollars to deploy and are willing to bid up the price just to get that money on the street. So you have to balance on the sourcing side, um, a desire to put money to work, but a, a, um, a, a reality for, you know, being very, very, not, not feeling like you're forced to purchase. And what we've found in the last 90 days is that we've been able to back our bids up so we've been, bid, we've been bidding to a model of 18 to 20% returns in our model. We've backed our bids sometimes as much as 10 points, and we are still getting hit on, on negotiated trades with counterparties. That just goes to show where this market is going. If there's no buyers, and we're the only ones at the table with a good uh, reputation for closing, then there's a lot of opportunity for us. Obviously, collateral valuation is the key to purchasing. You make your money on the buy when you buy these pools of mortgages. And then taking those loans into our servicer, overseeing our servicer and our lawyers are a, a key element to the process. But I think what makes us really special is the way that we asset management. Our boots on the ground our ability to communicate with borrowers face-to-face -face and one-on-one. -on -one. Remember, $100 million worth of real estate uh, mortgage loans uh, in the residential market might only be, might be about 400 loans on average. Uh, well, take this into account. The average servicer, the average asset manager, one person that works on a desk at a loan servicer usually has at least a thousand loans to manage in their portfolio. We've got an entire team of people across the country managing half that number. So it gives you an idea that we have the capacity and the ability to give individual attention to each of our borrowers. Um, we have a network of real estate brokers, mortgage loan originators, loss mitigators, agents, attorneys, and servicing partners who are boots on the ground in all 50 states. They're all FDCPA trained, but the number one thing we tell them is don't collect debt. That's not what we do when we communicate with our borrowers. We talk about resolution strategies. We talk about ways to help our borrowers move away from this distressed situation with dignity and integrity. And we do so by giving waivers of deficiency, by helping set people up in rental properties, by uh, paying them for consent judgments, by negotiating d discounted payoffs, or in the most ideal situation, which we do with about 30% of our portfolio, we will keep our borrowers in the property. We will tell our borrowers, we're not Bank of America, we're not some servicing company that that, that fit, has to fit you into our bureaucracy. We're willing to work with you. And so what we find is um, we actually have our best return when we keep our borrowers in the property, give them a chance to reconstitute their loans through principal reductions, debt forgiveness. As private equity we, that is unleveraged, we have a lot of uh, options at our disposal and that's, uh, and that's key to our success. I think that's what's made us build that better mousetrap. So where are we at today? Here we are, June 23rd. These are headlines I've pulled off the internet just in the last 72 hours. 
Uh, needless to say, we expected home sales in May to show a plunge because in March and April, nobody was out looking at properties. That said, we saw a tremendous increase in missed mortgage payments. These loans are not considered in default. Many of them are uh, in forbearance plans. Everyone's aware of the 90-day forbearance plan, Penny Freddie and, and, and some of the private mortgagers are, have offered their clients. We know for a fact the data is saying that there, between Black Knight reported that between eight and 9% of mortgages uh, government insured mortgages are have are in forbearance today. So let's just think this through. If two thirds of those in forbearance start paying again, which is optimistic, but let's just say optimistically 66% of the 9% currently in forbearance uh, stop paying their uh, start paying their mortgages July 1st when these forbearance agreements end. That leaves 3% of the total mortgage market that could be going into default. And a default really isn't considered an NPL until it's 90 days down. So I recommend everyone keep their eyes on this space, on this market, because we're going to start to see indications over the next 90 days of really where this thing is going to land. The obvious wild card in all of this is the Federal Reserve. We don't know, uh, well, we do know that we can expect um, market that, the, that there will be political pressure uh, to continue pumping this money with printed, continue uh, pumping this market with printed money uh, through the end of the year, at least through the election. Um, the facts are that all the money in the world uh, isn't going to necessarily put people back to work. It's not going to make buy consumers spend uh, the way they once did or act in the way they once did. So if only a small percentage of those in forbearance um, uh, do continue to not be able to pay their mortgage, then we obviously um, are looking at a serious, serious influx of non-performing debt and a serious influx of, uh, uh, of opportunity. Um, well, <clears throat> Is this the end of the world? Of course not. This is the most important thing to understand because a, a lot of what I'm outlaying is not good news. And, and the fact is, is that a lot of people are struggling. Um, when I moved to California, it was the first week of April, I RV'd across country from uh, Florida to California. Uh, and uh, on my eighth day, I landed in Palm Springs, which you wouldn't consider to be a very blue collar or distressed area. Uh, I got off the uh, freeway and I followed a line of cars that was over two miles long. This was the second week in April, one month into the COVID shutdown. There are food lines being uh, that, are, that are all over this country and a lot of people are struggling. Once this PPE stops, once the, the printing of money and the government handouts start to, to dwindle, markets can get back to some level of no normalization. Um, and it's not good news right now, but remember this is not the end of the world. Markets are cyclical. We were, at, we were very frothy. We were at the top of a market going into 2020. So there was always an expectation of a reset. We were already uh, plateauing our, our, our valuations and in some areas of the country, figuring in negative HPI into our modeling. So uh, the one thing I would remind is that there is opportunity today. There is uh, the greatest opportunity comes when people are sitting on the sidelines, when your competitors are afraid to get into the market. That's when, the, when they, you know, proverbial blood in the streets, that's when you want to uh, strike. So that's it for my panel today. Uh, uh, thank you for, so much for listening. If you'd like to email me, uh, I could send you some, a copy of my book, uh, or you're welcome to buy it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Um, why don't we go ahead and, and jump to some questions while we have a few minutes remaining. <clears throat> Okay, let's see here. Alexander Godolsky, um, 
Bill, when do you expect the deal flow on secondary market to pick up? Alex, very good question. Um, we actually have seen a tremendous pickup already, um, but where uh, there is there's a, a small segment, um, business purpose loans, hard money loans, a couple of leveraged investors. Um, we currently have 30 deals in due diligence. And some of them are little small pools, but, um, but some of them are, are decent, healthy deals. Uh, so the market has already started to see an uptick in, in deals. That said, Alex, uh, the, the, real, um, the real indications will come in September, October. Remember, July 1 is when a lot of these forbearance plans expire and people will be expecting, uh, expected to make payments. And I expect the loan servicers have already screwed up the forbearance programs. Uh, I'm, uh, I read an article yesterday about the 25,000 CFPB complaints just in the last night, uh, 60 days as a result of these some of these servicers and, and banks and interpreting the forbearance programs as balloon payments. So if you couldn't afford one payment three months ago, now the bank on July 1 says, okay, well, you're out of forbearance, but now you got to pay us three payments. What do you think is going to happen? It's obvious that there is, um, uh, there is going to be some stress on the horizon. And what I expect is fourth quarter of this year will be um, either right before or right after the election will be some of the best buying opportunities we've ever seen in the NPL market. Ari Meltzer, what kind of returns are your partners historically seeing in the space? Um, we have done this now for just over a decade. Uh, as I mentioned, we're over, we're close to a billion now of equity placed in this market. And uh, we've, we've uh, seen a range of, of returns, but across the board on average, our portfolios return about, uh, return mid-teens, you know, an average of 15. We model to the high teens. We've actually changed our modeling to the low 20s. We expect the purchases we make in the next six to 12 months uh, to, to easily hit our average mid-teen uh, track record. And, um, and if all goes well, we expect those returns to be much greater. I think that's it. Uh, I don't see any other questions here. Um, thank you all for attending and I will give it back to Bill, you have one more uh, question oh. that came in, if you want to yeah. take the time. I'm going to take the screen back, but you can answer the question. Okay, you take the screen back, and I'll answer the one question. No problem. Uh, do you feel hardest hit uh, – do you, do you have a feel for hardest hit geographies? Very good question, Tom. Um, yes, there are – within each market of the country, there are subsets of uh, – within that uh, we're seeing getting hit. Obviously – high super jumbo real estate in Manhattan is falling off a cliff. But that happened this, uh, several years ago, to be honest with you. It's kind of an unspoken thing that, that, that Manhattan was already too frothy. Um, where we're, uh, we're also seeing it, where, where I expect to see it is also in the, the markets around this country that were, you would either refer to as a green and growing market or you would call what you and I might consider a low income area, uh, an area that was maybe more suited for investors and first time home buyers. And those homes that and traditionally would sell between $100,000 and $200,000 that are now selling in the twos and $300,000. And that's a lot because of the, uh, the fact that it's cheaper to borrow $200,000 than it is to pay rent on that same house. Um, as the multifamily asset class starts to see compression and downward movement in the rents that they can ask, it's gonna be less advantageous for buyers in those lower end markets uh, to buy new stuff. So you have the biggest potential. And obviously the demographics of, of each market play a role. Um, we do look at each loan and where it's at and each, each piece of collateral uh, as we're purchasing it. Um, and uh, then Blaha has a question. Can you touch base on commercial NPL market? Um, I will, my, yes. I will tell you this about commercial NPL. Um, one of the things that has surprised me 
uh, and it was a, a slide I used earlier, uh, was how much the banks have gotten back into direct lending. And when I say banks, I'm saying international, national, and community banks combined make up now 63 or 70% of the new originations in commercial debt over the last few years. And that's probably why you heard the Fed, the Fed guy from the Midwest come out and say, listen, if it gets bad, bank, we could end up in another financial crisis. The good news is, is banks are well, are, have a lot of money. They're not highly leveraged, as I pointed out. Um, and I would just say that um, I was surprised to see some of the opportunities coming across my desk in the commercial market. Um, example, I mentioned a, a portfolio of performing commercial loans, about 80 million that came to us last month. And this was a, a, a leveraged investor in the commercial debt market uh, who was forced to move. And normally they would pay, you would see this performing debt. I mean, we're talking about 40 LTV loans on, on McDonald's in the Midwest that would normally sell for par or 102 all day long. And that stuff traded in the 80s and 90s last month. Um, so there is going to be quite a bit of, of opportunity in the commercial market. It's going to be different than how it was before. And, um, uh, and uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how, how it all pans out, given the fact that this COVID epidemic obviously has, uh, uh, has affected all asset classes. Um, the one thing that's great about what we do is that residential real estate, I think, will have legs in the future. One of the things that COVID has taught us is the value of our homes. It's no longer just a place to sleep and eat. It's now our offices, our places of work, our places to enjoy people in the backyard. And, um, and as was mentioned in several of the earlier conversations today, um, you know, everyone needs a place to live. And, uh, and so I think that in the long run, I think we're fine in the residential side. Commercial, it's going to be a shakeup. You know, commercial was a kick the can down the road last time. And the only thing that prevented a huge meltdown in commercial 10 years ago was low interest rates and market liquidity. Uh, they just kicked it, kicked it, kicked it. Obviously, um, they can't keep doing that forever. Bill, you have uh, more questions that are coming I'm, in. I'm going to yeah. send them to you so that I'll, you can answer them, them directly. Um, I, I appreciate you going super interesting, very important, important part of what's coming up. Um, appreciate your presentation. It was well done, well thought Thank through. You, Thank you for being the best part of Flyer. We appreciate you. Oh, sweet. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. All right. Thank you.